dear presidents, dear speakers, dear URAS members, guests, colleagues and friends, on behalf of Eurasian Universities Union, URAS, I would like to welcome you all uh, to our URAS online workshop on blockchain and new technologies in Africa, which is the third online event of this academic year as URAS. I greet all of our audience respectfully on behalf of URAS. During today's workshop, we will explore what is involved with such radical technological change to answer the unknowns about blockchain. So we would like to welcome all of our esteemed guest speakers from our partner organizations, from Accra Technical University, the Hague University of Applied Sciences, Blockchain Army, as well as Istanbul Aydın University Blockchain Center. Please be reminded that the recording of this webinar will be shared on URAS website as well as on our URAS YouTube account. We will send certificate of attendance to all those who attend fully to this today's online workshop. Please be also informed that you can ask your questions via the chat or q &A functions of Zoom. I'm glad to inform you that we will share a calendar, an online calendar of form term events of URAS on URAS website during October. So we hope to see you at our upcoming online events as well. So let me introduce today's online workshop moderator, Professor Dr. Ahmed Sedat Aybar, who is the director of Istanbul Aydın University Africa Center. As time and flow of the webinar workshop permits, our mod moderator, Professor Aybar, will try to ask your questions to our guest speakers at the end of their talks. I would like to thank personally, as well as on behalf of URAS to Professor Ibar for moderating today's workshop and our esteemed speakers for joining us. And I would like to leave the microphone now to Professor Ibar to in order to moderate our workshop. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, Ms. Elbasan. Um, rather Mrs. Elbasan these days, right? Uh, with the uh, change of um, your status, yeah, your yeah, marital status. <laughs> thank you, Ivar. Uh, congratulations for that as well. Thank you Anyways, so much. Anyways, um, thank you very much for joining us to this very interesting webinar. And um, times are tough. Times are very difficult. And during these difficult times, um, something has been introduced into our lives that is online conferences, online meetings. It has been in our lives, but now it's becoming more and more widespread. Hence, we are able to do um, such an event here today. Um, I'm not going to go on uh, very long, but I'm going to just introduce how the flow of today's meeting is going to happen. Now, uh, first of all, we are going to do opening remarks. Um, first, at um, the Hague University of Applied Sciences, Theo Bosma who is joining us, um, replacing um, Mr. Poimbrock uh, to do the opening, opening remarks um, from The Hague. We have colleagues um, joining us from Accra, Ghana, and um, Dr. Winful, he is going to do his opening remarks. Then um, URAS president and president of Istanbul Aydın University Associate Professor Dr. Mustafa Aydın will do his opening remarks. These are also important interventions. And then we'll go straight into, into our panelists' presentations. Now, we have esteemed panelists from London, Erol who is um, who is at the center of all these changes, particularly with regards to technology. And as far as technology is concerned with blockchain technologies, he is joining us from London. So we are thanking him uh, for this. Then um, Frank Frimpong Op Opuni uh, from Accra will do his intervention. Then we have our good old friend Irene Donjo. Um, he's a senior lecturer at the Hague University. He'll do his intervention. So this is going to be the flow of today's, um, today's event. And I'm not going to uh, talk. Professor much. Ibar, I, I'm so sorry to interrupt you. I'm terribly sorry. President Aydin is just, I think, coming in and he's at a, in another conference as well. If you can, okay. once he comes in, if you can give the floor first to him, I'll really appreciate it because he has to I go see. back to the 
come back okay. again. He'll Absolutely. be here shortly. If you can follow him up. Uh, okay. Just, just a so small shall reminder. we shall we wait for a couple of minutes or should we continue, Iraman? Miss Pinar, I think he she's following up. Is she is he here? Uh she she hasn't uh, he hasn't arrived yet. Mm -hmm. When he arrives, you will uh, just maybe give the floor to him, and uh, you okay. you may start now, but then take him in between okay. maybe. Um, this you know these are very very busy times because we are just starting our term, um, and um, the president is extremely uh, busy as well. I'm sure you are all extremely busy, but um, Theo would I hope you don't mind. If I interrupt you when he comes in and does his intervention and then uh, goes away, um, so if that is okay with you, I'm going to give the floor to Professor Dr. Theo Bosma from the Hague University to do his intervention. Please yes, go ahead. Thank you very much, and I don't mind if you interrupt me, uh, actually, because you are the important folks. Um, I'm just here to uh, to do the kickoff, and um, I'm very excited about this because, especially, uh, you know, um, Irene and I, we worked on this uh, very hard. Actually, Irene more than I did, and uh, we already kicked off some meetings uh, in Ghana, and I see our friends from Ghana as well uh, in the meeting. So I'm very happy, and I'm not going to repeat all the names that you said, but uh, very well. Warm welcome to all of you uh, from, uh, you know, the University of The Hague of Applied Sciences. Um, I've been around in uh, for about like 35 years. Um, I'm already that old and uh, worked in the business for uh, 20 uh, for 35 years in six different uh, countries. And uh, I joined the university like seven years ago. And uh, my heart is basically between uh, the university and the business. And as you know, the role of the financial controller is changing more to the role of a business controller. And at this moment in time, it's not anymore about the numbers, but it's also about uh, you know, sustainability, about circular economy. And um, you know, and taking care of the planet, uh, taking care of the planet and the people. You all know Kate Rayworth, who came with her donut economy framework, and so things are changing uh, rapidly. And uh, one of the things that I like about us and our partners, our partner universities, is that we are always very much eager and engaged into bringing the business into our university and bringing the business into our curriculum. I mean, it is. It was a pleasure when I was in Ghana uh, with Accra, and we saw our students, you know, talking about blockchain, and 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 they know that they have a huge advantage of those folks who are behind. We, our partners, are the leaders of the pack, and for sure that our students will have something different. They have something different from the rest of all the other students. They will be financial experts in blockchain in uh, data transformation, in circular economy, in platform economy, in the serendipity economy, all those buzzwords that are actually no buzzwords anymore, but it's like the economy uh, in which we live today. So uh, I'm very enthusiastic, uh, irony is, and also Philip, and you know what, we are uh, making every effort to whatever uh, happens in the world even now with COVID-19 in a very difficult world, people have to move very quickly uh, from one solution to another. Um, and uh, we are very proud to say that, you know, like you guys are doing today in your workshop, we bring the knowledge and the experience together with our students and therefore are the leaders of uh, the uh, world economy, for sure. So I highly encourage this. Um, I think that this is just the beginning. Uh, I think, uh, again, I talked to uh, Istanbul uh, a couple of weeks ago or months ago, uh, and I'm sure that Irene and I, we will go there uh, whenever we can. And uh, we will bring some other partners as well, like Finland, the University of Tampere, uh, University of San Francisco de Victoria in Madrid, 
and together with you guys and Africa and other strategic partners that have come on board, we're going to become one powerhouse. I guess that's all I wanted to say. Um, thank you very much, uh, Professor Bosma. You have, um, you have opened up a very optimistic and powerful uh, base for our endeavor. Um, now, uh, let me inform you that we are joined uh, from uh, many people around the world, uh, from Azerbaijan, from Libya, you know, as far as um, uh, other places. So it's a, it's, um, and people are joining and it's becoming an increasingly an international um, webinar now. Um, having said this, if during the webinar, participants want to ask questions, they could, just to save time, they could write it, they could send them um, using their chat box, they could send their uh, questions um, through the chat box. Now I'm going to turn to Accra, to um, Dr. Winful, um, to do his intervention, and, but I'm going to ask uh, Dr. Winful if he minds when the uh, Istanbul Aydin University President comes in, if we just interrupt you for a few minutes uh, to do his intervention, to do his remarks, welcoming remarks. And then we continue with that. Um, floor is yours, Christian. Hello, do I have the floor? Yeah. Yeah, good morning. And I'm from Accra Technical University. I'm privileged to associate ourselves with this workshop. And my Appreciation goes to Hague University for pulling us along when it comes to blockchain. I remember is it four years ago when they told us they want us to have a workshop on blockchain. It was my first time of hearing the word blockchain. And it was a challenge even to how to explain to members. I asked a lot of colleagues around and it looks strange, a new thing, and I was finding it very difficult to even explain to management what that thing was about. I'm happy Mr. Opuni is here. Mr. Opuni is a great guy. So I happened to bump into Mr. Opuni and I told him, this is what our partners are talking about, blockchain, and I don't know what to do. Immediately I told him, he said, yes, I'm into it. And Opuni has been pushing me and today we are here. I'm very, very happy and I appreciate Opuni for the support. After that, I started following a blockchain and I realized blockchain is a big platform. But the challenge we are having in Africa is even to understand it. I said, I myself do not have a lot of knowledge in it. Most lecturers do not have a lot of knowledge in it. And we are supposed to impart the knowledge to our students so that the next generation will know about blockchain and move with it. But I'm happy Haig has given us a platform, even though most lecturers do not have the knowledge to impart blockchain. We are doing that using a platform called Chaos, which we enroll our students on that platform and they have live lectures with Haig University. It's going on very well, but as you said, the, block, um, the COVID is now the challenge we are having, it's becoming very difficult for students to really follow. But so far, so good. We are following very, very well. I pray this workshop open more opportunity for Africa, in particular ATU, so that we all can grow, and then Africa will not be left behind as we're left behind during the internet era. I hope Africa will move with the rest of the world with this new technology. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, th thank you very much, um, Dr. Christian Winful. Um, you know, this kind of technology provides us with many opportunities. It brings in a lot of stuff. I, I mean, as far as COVID-19 is concerned, now we are um, leapfrogging this era. We are going to, um, you know, a lot of changes are coming into our lives. 
with okay. um, COVID-19 and technology is enabling us to do things with our students, with um, our colleagues around the world. And, you know, one peculiar character of this kind of transformation of technology is that it brings in um, innovative minds, you know, to make some radical changes in our day-to-day -day life. And that provides um, everyone with equal opportunity. Africa is no ex ex exception. Of course, when we talk about Africa, we don't think Africa is one country, but there are many countries in Africa. There are many different regions. But um, as far as um, the narrative goes, that seeing African experience as a, uh, as a tragedy, the poverty and in income inequalities and desertification and migration and all sorts of tragic events that is portrayed in the media across the world about Africa, which is not necessarily true, but be it as it may, this kind of technology is providing Africa and other places equal opportunities for catching up and uh, bringing about change. So at Istanbul Aydin University Africa Research Center, we do, you know, using this kind of vision, we do a lot of stuff on Africa. And um, I'll be very much pleased uh, to collaborate with you and the Accra Technology University and with other African um, colleagues in the future. And um, as Professor Bosma was saying, this will probably will provide with our um, knowledgeable friends from London and from other places, will provide a nice, good, strong uh, platform to bring out those innovative innovative side of um, the African traditions, African um, you know, side of things. And that is going to serve Africa. People like Donjia, Irene Donjia, are very much instrumental in such thing. So um, every time I talk to Irene, I know I'm talking to a historical figure. So, and I'm very, very happy to have met you, uh, Dr. Winfall. Now, it seems like um, Irene disappeared and our president isn't there. So uh, Punar Hanım, maybe we should move on to start our presentations. You know, putting a, um, a what do they call, you know, a, a remark that um, we might interrupt you while you are doing your presentation. But first of all, I would like to invite Errol Lusser from London. It seems like it is a sunny London, um, Mr. Lusser. I'm looking at the background and seeing uh, it's sun, sun is shining in London, it's not raining. So um, he is, he is a, he is a founder um, of Blockchain Army, and he is a CEO of Blockchain Army. He is, uh, he is living in London, and he is very much in the center of these changes. So let me leave the floor to Errol Lusser to do his intervention. And I hope you don't mind if we interrupt you while the um, president comes in. OK, floor is yours, um, Mr. Lusser. Hello to all. Thank you very much, Professor Ibar. First of all, I should convince I'm in, not in London, I'm in Bodrum. It's the best. So, that explains, you see the nice you know, weather I was, I was puzzled. What is this? <laughs> Excellent. <laughs> and therefore, I have the smiling face. So, uh, thank you very much. First of all, thank you very much. You honored me, inviting me to that webinar. Yes, uh, I am a blockchain enthusiast, and we would like to widen as much as the blockchain use in the world. I, I know all the speakers, they know what is blockchain, but I would like to kindly just in one sentence, I would like to describe blockchain again uh, for the uh, listeners and participants. Blockchain is the digital distributed and decentralized ledger underlying most virtual currencies that's responsible for logging all for a financial intermediary such as a bank. In, in other words, 
It's a new means of transmitting funds and or logging information. So why the sudden need for blockchain? Blockchain is the vision of developers who believed that the current banking system had flows. In particular, they viewed banks acting as third parties and pilfering transactions fees as unnecessary and they scoffed at the idea the payment validation and settlement could take up to five business days in cross-border transactions. With blockchain, real-time transactions are a possibility even across the borders. While banks are left out, the equation entirely, presumably reducing transaction fees. Is that all for blockchain? No. There are other uses for blockchain too, beyond the currency setting. Numerous Dow Jones Industrial Average Components are testing out some of these uses in small-scale projects and controlled demos right now. You are probably wondering what this potential game-changing technology can actually do in our real world and during the corona time. Well, you should not wonder more. I want to count some uh, where we can use blockchain in a real time manner. First of all, we can use it in payment processing and money transfers, as I mentioned uh, before. Arguably the most logical use for blockchain is a means to expedite the transfers of funds from one party to another. As noted, with banks removed the equitation and validation of transactions ongoing 24 hours a day, seven days a week. Most transactions processed over a blockchain can be settled within a matter of seconds. I can say to you today, uh, there is a lot of cross-border payments uh, using blockchain, example, between Germany and Kenya, uh, Russia and uh, Poland, and uh, many different samples like Chinese, uh, China and Mongolia. The second one is monitor of supply chains. Blockchain also comes in particularly handy when it comes to monitoring supply chains. By removing paper-based trails, businesses should be able to pinpoint inefficiencies within their supply chains quickly as well as locate items in real time. Further, blockchain would allow businesses and possibly even consumers to view how products performed from a quality control perspective as they traveled from their place of origin to the retainer. Third one is retail loyalty rewards program. Blockchain could further revolutionize the retail experience by becoming the go-to for loyalty rewards by creating a token-based system that rewards consumers and storing these tokens within a blockchain. It will incentivize consumers to return to a certain store or chain to do their shopping. It will also eliminate the fraud and waste commonly associated with paper and card-based loyalty rewards program. The fourth thing is one of the very important thing in this today's world is digital IDs. More than 1 billion people worldwide face identity challenges. And then blockchainer is looking to change that. It is creating digital IDs within its authenticator applications, currently used by millions of people, which will give users a way to control their digital identities. This would allow folks in impoverished regions to get access to financial services or start their own business as an example. Of course, giant companies like Microsoft's attempts to create a decentralized digital ID are still in the early stages. 
Fifth is very important, data sharing. As you know, it was a cryptocurrency long time ago, IOTA, launched a beta version of its data marketplace long time ago, demonstrating that blockchain could be used as a marketplace to share or sell unused data since most enterprise data goes unused, blockchain could act as an intermediary to store and move this data to improve a host of industries. While still it is in early ages, I would say, stages, IOTA has more than 35 brand name participants offering its feedback. And one of them is again, Microsoft. Sixth one is copyright and royalty protection. In a world with growing internet access, copyright, ownership laws on music and other content has grown hazy. With blockchain, those copyright laws could be beefed up considerably for digital content downloads, ensuring the artist or creator of the content being purchased gets their fair share. The blockchain will also provide real-time and transparent royalty distribution data to musicians and content creators. Seven, digital voting. Worried about water fraud? Well, worry no more with blockchain technology, I can say. Blockchain offers the ability to vote digitally, but it is transparent enough that any regulators will be able to see if something were changed on the network. It combined the ease of digital voting with the immutability of blockchain to make your vote truly count and not be changed. The eighth one is the real estate land or uh, car title transfers. One of the primary goals of blockchain is to take paper out of equation since paper trails are often a source of Confusion. If you are buying or selling land, a house or a car, you'll need to transfer or receive a title. Instead of handling this on paper, blockchain can store titles on its network for a transparent view of this transfer, as well as presenting a crystal clear picture of legal ownership. Ninth is the food safety. Yet another intriguing use of, for blockchain could be in tracing food from its origin to your plate. Since blockchain data is immutable, you'd be able to trace the transport of food products from their origin to the supermarket. What's more, should there be a foodborne illness, blockchain will allow the source of contaminant to be found considerably quicker than it can be now. Tenth is immutable data backup. Blockchain might also be perfect way to backup data, even though cloud storage system are designed to be a go-to source for data safekeeping, they are not immune to hackers or even infrastructure problems. Using blockchain as a backup source for cloud data centers or for any data, we can, I can say as Boeing is considering with GPS receivers on its planes could resolve this concern. 11 is tax regulation and compliance. Have I mentioned how important transparency and immutability are yet? For example, it's very popular now, hemp companies in the market and they can use blockchain as a means to record their sales and demonstrate to lawmakers that they are abiding by local, state or federal laws. More importantly, these sales act as a clear record for the IRS that they have paid their fair share of taxes to the federal government, assuming they are profitable. Twelve is workers' rights. Another interesting use for blockchain is a means to bolster the rights of workers around the globe. According to the ILO, 
International Labor Organization, 25 million people worldwide work in forced labor conditions. Coca-Cola, along with the US State Department and other partners, is working on a blockchain registry complete with smart contracts, protocols that verify, facilitate, or enforce a contract to improve labor policies and coerce employers to honor digital contracts with their workers. 13th, medical record keeping. The good news is the medical sector has been already moving away from paper for record keeping purposes for years. However, blockchain offers even more safety and convenience one. In addition to storing patients' records, the patient who possesses the key to access these digital records will be in control of who gains access to their data. It would be a means of strengthening of the many health insurance policies, laws in different countries that are designed to protect patient privacy. Fourteen, deepens tracking. One of the hot button topics on any news network at the moment is gun control and or weapons accountability. Blockchain could create a transparent and unchanging registry network that allows law enforcement and the federal government to track gun and weapon ownership as well as keep a record of weapons sold privately. Fifteenth, wills and inheritances. Blockchain may also be able to put your end of life concerns to rest. Rather than creating a paper will, people may have the option of creating and storing their digital will on a blockchain network. When used with smart contracts, which could divvy out inheritances based on when certain criteria are met. Example, when a grandchild reaches a certain age. Wills should become crystal clear and legally binding, leaving no questions as to who should receive that, what assets when you pass away. Sixteenth, equity trading. At some point, blockchain could revile or replace current equity trading platforms to buy or sell stocks because blockchain networks validate and settle transactions so quickly it could eliminate the multi-day wait time investors encounter when selling stocks and seeking access to their funds for the purpose of reinvestment or withdrawal. 17. Managing Internet of Things Networks. Networking giant Kisco systems may be behind a blockchain-based application that would monitor Internet of Things, IoT, networks. The IoT describes wirelessly connected devices that can send and receive data. Such an application could determine the trustworthiness of devices on a network and continuously do so for devices entering and leaving the network, such as smart cars or smartphones. 18. Expediting energy futures trading and compliance. Even the energy industry is getting it in on an act. Similar to the benefits it could bring to equity traders about, as I mentioned before, blockchain offers the ability to help energy companies settle futures trading considerably faster than they currently they do. It's also worth noting that blockchain could help energy companies with regard to logging their resources and maintaining regulatory compliance. 19. Securing access to belongings. Smart contracts within blockchain networks also have the ability to be customized to a business's or a consum consumer's needs. As a consumer, you could use blockchain as a means to grant access to your house, 
for service technicians or allow your mechanic access to your car to perform repairs. But without this digital key that only you possess, this service technicians would be not able to gain access to your belongings. 20, tracking prescription of drugs. Finally, I would say, this is the last one. Blockchain could be a means of transparently tracking prescriptions medicines. In a world where prescription returns do occur and counterfeit medications are a real thing, blockchain offers drug makers the ability to track their products based on serial and or batch numbers to ensure that consumers are getting the real deal when they pick up medicine from the pharmacy. And I can say Merck is currently testing such a system for prescription drug returns. I would like to conclude my words saying blockchain is far from perfect. It's certainly there is some other applications that I didn't mention. And as the last sentence, I would like to say, because I was expecting that uh, Professor Ibar will announce, I'm very proud to know that the uh, Aydın University has approved by higher education of Turkey, YÖK, to open the first blockchain academy and center in Turkey. Thank you very much for listening to me. Thank, thank you very much for this um, concise presentation. Um, yes, I, I was leaving it to be announced by the president because now we, in our um, university, we have a blockchain center authorized by higher education authority. And please correct me if I am wrong, um, Mr. Rusar, that this center is the very first blockchain center associated with a university in Turkey, right? Yeah. Yeah. So, I think almost the second or the third one in the world. Right. In the world. That is. Yeah. So, um, hence, for our colleagues from The Hague, from Accra, you know, this is a uh, center to be associated with. And probably you'll be uh, following this, Don Gia and Dr. Winful opening. So um, thanks for announcing that. I think we should move on to uh, Frank Frimpong Opuni. We heard a lot about him, and um, he's an excellent speaker. Um, if you have a PowerPoint presentation, Mr. Opuni, please, um, you can use your share screen button, and then you can uh, share it with us. So the floor is yours. All right, thank you. Mm -hmm. uh, please, can you see my screen now? Yes, uh, we could see your screen. If you turn it to um, presentation mode or into full screen, that will be much better. But this is fine. Okay, we are on full screen Wonderful. now. M Wonderful, thank you. Great. Go ahead. Yeah, so um, folks, my name is Frank Frimpon Okuni. I'm a senior lecturer in the marketing department within the Faculty of Business in Accra Technical University, Ghana. Uh, I've been with the university for the past 10 years. Uh, basically, I, I see myself to be scientific in nature because I believe in independent learning. And for that matter, I always seek to inquire about what is going on. And that led me to stumble into the concept of blockchain. So it came as no real surprise for me when Irene stumbled our way. And then we had to, you know, sort of take away some misconceptions from the minds of fellow um, lecturers. In any case, because of the scam that had gone on as regarding cryptocurrency, there's lots of misconception around blockchain in Ghana and Africa in general. And for that matter, trying to um, do advocacy for blockchain comes along with a whole lots, whole lots of um, kind of repression and also misconception. For this particular presentation, this is the outline that I have. Um, blockchain conceptualized, we look at the key sectors for blockchain in Africa. 
basically in the financial sector, real estate, agriculture, supply chain, and then we look at the challenges. I must say there are a whole lot of sectors for which blockchain can be applied, as has been elucidated clearly uh, by our professor. But these are the few ones that I would like to highlight so that we can get a clear picture of what is going on in Africa. Blockchain technology is a distributed um, electronic ledger containing digital records, transactions, or events that are protected with advanced encryptions. In other words, once data is stored on blockchain, it is immutable and can only be changed to consensus of all members on the system. It is therefore extremely hard to tamper and updatable only through consensus algorithm, which is agreeable to all connected network nodes. So the blockchain concept um, allows for transparency. It also allows for dig digitization immutability, and we can even have um, contracts um, placed on the blockchain. All right, so in Africa, blockchain and related fourth industrial revolution technologies, such as artificial intelligence, machine learning, digital, deep learning, internet of things, um, has caught up with us, okay, especially in the areas of finance real estate, agriculture, supply chain, and many other sectors. But as I said early on, I'll be hammering on finance, real estate, agriculture, and the supply chain. One major example, this is how it started in the, finance, in the financial sector, as I want to see it. Um, m launched in 2007. It allows customers to use simple test messages and send money, make deposits, and withdrawals, and purchase at a minutes. What I want to hammer on is that this is about digitization of value of currency or mobile platforms. And it helps to reduce costs across borders and facilitate economic transactions. Now, from this idea, we see similar ideas also coming up. In the first three years, MPESA was able to generate more than 600 billion worth of US dollars. Okay. MPESA. Um, it, it's managed by Safaricom, which is also a subsidiary of Vodafone, and it's based in Kenya. All right, so these are the countries um, where M-Pesa um, operates. M-Pesa simply is about, it, it's, it's, it means mobile money. Okay, Pesa is a Swahili name for, for, for money. All right, now related to this is some, it's another aspect called BitPesa, BitPesa. The BitPesa is a trading platform which helps companies and their customers make payments in digital currencies um, using Bitcoin and other cryptocurrencies from and within frontier markets. So BitPesa also came into the scene. Initially, they, they worked with M-Pesa, but later, due to some legal issues, BitPesa had to um, separate. So this is about transactions, huge transactions, cutting across borders within split seconds for money to be transferred across um, countries. So started in 2013 in Kenya and currently has representatives in London, Luxembourg and more. So initially we had the BitPesa Bitcoin exchange platform, which was developed for transfers of Kenyan citizens to send money to mobile money um, wallets. It started in 2015 in African countries and the main purpose is to decentralized okay, um, the, the, the transfer of money across bank accounts and also throughout the global economy. Now, I would want to transition into the public sector within the finance sector. Now let's see very practical scenarios of how blockchain is helping African countries or potentially help African countries to save lots of money. Corruption is a serious canker. And I see that blockchain is a serious disruptive technology that is coming to take up Africa. But we need to be gradual and then let the process roll. In 2018, in Tanzania, government was able to weed out thousands of ghost workers in the public sector through the implementation of the blockchain technology. This audit work has been beneficial to the states, allowing the government to save substantial amounts of money. The issue of ghost names 
is very peculiar to the Ghanaian economy too, because the government of Ghana loses money each year, serious amounts of money, through the payments of, of monies, through the public system, to accounts which are owned by nobody. Okay, and so we, we call those people um, ghost workers. And this is a serious leakage of public funds year, year in, year out. And Tanzania has started this. In fact, in Ghana, the Auditor General has started, uh, you know, implementing or experimenting uh, with blockchain in public audits, and it has started yielding results. We pray we get to the Tanzanian way very soon. Okay, so these are some figures for you. Tanzania has been losing 430 billion Tanzanian shillings every month in the payment of fictitious wages. This means that the equivalent of $195 million cannot be distributed properly. So you see how blockchain is helping Tanzania to save in terms of money uh, year in, year out. Now let's look at the real estate sector. We go to Nigeria. House Africa is a real estate company based on the blockchain started by two young men. It was founded in May 2018 to tackle problems around land ownership. It, there's a serious problem with land ownership in Africa. The issue of ownership leads to lots of um, litigations and therefore investors find it difficult acquiring land to engage in businesses. So this startup intends to help to um, solve this problem. So what it does is that it has, it has now partnered with the Nigeria Mortgage Refinance Company for this disruptive venture. This is a huge project going on in Nigeria now. The Nigeria Mortgage Refinance Company was incorporated on 24 June 2013 as a public limited liability company registered with the Securities Exchange Commission and regulated by the Central Bank of Nigeria. Okay, so I want us to know that this is, this is a huge project and it is going to make serious impact in the real estate um, sector in Nigeria. So House Africa intends to provide an immutable ledger alongside a visual map reference to ensure integrity in land titles. Okay, and I think this was hinted and by uh, our professor. So it, it allows for clear ownership so that it will um, kind of eliminate all issues of litigation uh, in our courts. But real ownership can be traced on the blockchain and therefore it will eliminate all forms of um, corruption in land issues, which is very, a very huge problem in Africa. Okay, so these are some of the benefits of this real exchange um, um, projects. And so the, 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 the owner or the co-founder of House Africa estimates that it is going to unlock monies around 300 billion and 900 billion uh, in terms of world creation with this project alone. And this income is expected to be generated within the next five to 10 year period. Let's come back to Ghana. In Ghana, we have a similar project called the Bitland, okay, which has also been started. And right now, it's experimenting in, a, in the second city of Ghana called Kumasi. Bitland is a bunch of tech pioneers from the US, Denmark, Ghana, who aim at fighting government corruption and empowering people through legal ownership. So we see the practicality, the reality of the application of blockchain. Um, in terms of land ownership. With this new system, users have more control over their data and the public ledger will verify the integrity of records without sacrificing the privacy of users. Okay, now, but this issue, the, the key issue about Big Land here is that they are seeking to transition to a more decentralized storage system. The current state of data management must be assessed because it is not easy to try to load data from the current system, which is so much compromised. So it will take a lot of time for this transition to go through, but the future looks very bright in terms of decentralization um, of records. Well, right now the records are decentralized at the large registry and it lends itself to whole lots of manipulation. And this is a problem. All right, so let's see 
Now we want to look at agriculture, the application of um, blockchain in the area of agriculture. I must say Kenya is doing very well because the government itself has set up a blockchain and artificial intelligence task force, okay, to, to help to move the blockchain agenda. Farmshine is an agri-tech platform that links farmers with suppliers, information, and service providers by removing intermediaries through a recorded and open distributed value chain. What this does is to give farmers, give farmers all the details necessary to access the market at a relatively lower cost. Okay, so it is a way to connect all the, the, the stakeholders um, in terms of agriculture so that farmers are able to have access um, to customers, customers are also able to trade the source of their products. And so once value is transferred on the blockchain, it reduces to a whole lot of uh, costs and therefore all the players within the chain benefit a lot. Farmshine was started in 2019. It brings farmers and buyers together for mutual benefits. Okay, now look at the prospects. It intends to cash in on 8 million smallholder farmers in Kenya, 40 million in East Africa, and nearly 1 billion around the world. This is highly disruptive. Think about local farmers, um, those who operate land tenure or peasant farming in Africa. They are at the downside of the benefits in production. Blockchain is going to help them to, to get value for their works. Think about mobile money uh, and then M-Pesa. Blockchain can also help in this area. So this company currently um, has been able to raise about $250,000 from a US-based impact investor called GMC Collapse. So this company from US has invested in Farmshine as a startup because they have seen great potential in this project. Supply chain, this will be my last um, aspect. In the supply chain arena too, we have Coronet blockchain from South Africa. Very interesting concept. It was founded in 2018 and built on blockchain technology. Coronet blockchain um, is an end-to-end -end transparent supply chain with ethical human hair products. Okay, vetted hair suppliers, sustainable salon businesses, verifiable and certified stylists skills, and peace of mind for consumers. So you see that consumers are able to trace the source of the human hair along the blockchain. So they themselves can verify that these human hair are of standard, okay? And therefore, it brings about transparency in trade. And at the end of the day, it creates value for the customer or the one who will finally use it, who is the consumer. So this is also a very nice concept. And this concept can be replicated, especially in the pharmaceutical industry, where there's lots of um, duplication and, and counterfeit in terms of pharmaceutical products. The blockchain can help to um, kind of trace the sources of all of these products. And at the end of the day, the consumer can benefit. In fact, the practical applications of blockchain are, are, are very huge and immense. So basically, the Coronet blockchain in South Africa, the system allows for the scanning of products, to download product quality certifications, fair warranties, and to protect consumer rights, which is a very huge issue um, um, in terms of um, trade and business in Africa. Just um, to sum up the challenges for blockchain or startups in Africa, energy consumption is a serious issue. The blockchain alone consumes about 100 times the power used by all of Google service. Is that okay? But think about Africa having um, huge energy generation problems. So you must find ways to make this sustainable. It is difficult to ensure, given the energy situation in Africa, we should begin to explore renewable energy sources, um, which can help sustain the blockchain agenda because the benefits are very huge. Technology issues, the risks associated with this network are very, very imminent. There are issues of network security. Okay, we have all heard about cyber attacks as well as the protection of data privacy. However, the blockchain itself has measures that securitizes the system. And therefore, 
with, with developments and more research, we hope that the issue of cyber attacks with blockchain can be, can, can be minimized, if not eliminated completely. Regulatory issues. Okay? So blockchain is sometimes about who regulates who. Because of the issue of decentralization, it can lend itself to a whole lot of uh, manipulations. But then um, regulation has to be an issue. In fact, that is why we also have um, hybrid concepts. For example, uh, we can have a hybrid concept where we have centralization as well as decentralization. The government can partner uh, with private companies in order to keep the agenda um, going. So the regulatory framework needs to be clear for us to develop the blockchain applications agenda. All right, I want to thank you so much for this presentation. I hope you have enjoyed it. Let's keep the discussion going. Thank you very much, Prof. Thank you very much, Frank. Um, that was very uh, prompt and right to the point. Excellent, I learned a lot from this presentation. Thank you so much. Um, now, there are some questions coming in, but I suggest we take questions at the end of the um, session. And let's hear what Irene Donjio had to say from The Hague University. And um, some of the participants uh, at all, Usara and Frank, you too, you have mentioned these things, that um, you know, blockchain actually opens up a lot of opportunities um, in application. And Donjio is working on one such application, the waste management and the use of blockchain in uh, waste management. Now let's hear what um, Don you had to say, and then we open the floor to question and answer session. Um, it's your turn, Irene. Go ahead. Yeah. Let me share my screen. In the meantime, please um, send your questions in and then we'll start answering them at the end of this. So good, good afternoon again. Uh, my name is Irene Donjo. I'm from The Hague University in the Netherlands. So I've been lecturing here for about 13 years. And before that, I worked with Western Union Money Transfer Company, which I'm gonna be talking also about today. And yeah, and uh, it's a good, the good thing to be uh, in the middle as a speaker is like, you're gonna just summarize what the others have said because we all talk about blockchain and the impact of blockchain and new technology on Africa. So I'm not, gonna, I'm not gonna keep repeating everything, but we all have in common a lot of uh, concepts to share, which I'm gonna, let's go through. So I hope you can all see my slides, uh, even though I have to bring this down, okay. Good, so um, breakthrough technology and blockchain on Africa. You know, when it comes to new technologies or breakthrough technologies, Africa has been always left behind. And, but as Professor said, and as Frank Ufuni says, it's not the case anymore because many of these technologies are free or cheap, right? So take a look at blockchain, virtual reality, augmented reality, mixed reality, artificial intelligence, internet things. So all these technologies are now accessible for many Africans at the same space as in the Western countries. So no excuse anymore for Africa to, to keep staying behind. It is our time now to just use those technologies to develop our continent. Okay, so let's take some example. Uh, look, this, this, this Sarah, for those who like uh, fashion shopping ladies, mostly, also men, of course. <laughs> so me, for example, I don't like uh, shopping because it's a waste of time. You're gonna go and, and try the shirt, try the pants, and then I sometimes I don't like that. But this company just came out with this application that they call the, virtu the virtual, the digital fitting room that would just uh, save you time. So just using this application, not having to go and, 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 and fit all those, those clothes, th this application would do the job for you through this, this virtual people inside, of course. And another, another success of, uh, is of this is IKEA. 
No? So before going to IKEA, suppose you want to buy a, a couch or a table or a bed, before even going to the shop, you can already using the application designing how, what color, where the couch is going to be in your house. It saves you time. Uh, look, uh, uh, traveling agency for them that they're, they're making a lot of business because now they can they can uh, promote their destination through just those virtual reality glasses. You put the, your glass on, you can already, already envision yourself being in the Bahamas, right? So this is great. African uh, African companies are also now using those te technology to to promote their product. Now we 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 talk a lot about blockchain. I'm just going to uh, summarize it in these five words. If you have listened very caref carefully to Professor, uh, I'm not forgetting the name, I'm sorry if I miss, Ero and Professor Frank Oponi, they mentioned this so blockchain is an open source protocol. So open for anyone to join, right? Not restricted. It is a shared ledger. So we all maintain the same book. So when you make a transaction, I can see what, whatever is going on. You can just go on, on, on Bitcoin transaction online. You can see a lot of transaction going on. But actually with the banks, actual bank, local traditional bank, you won't see that because it is regulated. It is very centralized. Blockchain is decentralized. It's, it is cryptographically secure. So you cannot hack a blockchain system because it is, as you understand, blockchain, chain after chain, they are connected. And then behind that, you have those miners that control what's happening on blockchain. A simple example of blockchain I can give you, not really similar, but Wikipedia. If you know how Wikipedia functions, if you want to publish something on Wikipedia, you're just going to write something because it is an open source, right? You write something, you put there. But before your, let's say your, uh, uh, your report or your uh, uh, is published, there are few people that checks it check the quality, if it's publishable or not. The same goes with blockchain, you know? There are a lot of people, what we call the miners behind the scene, are checking all those transactions. Meaning that if you change something, that's what, that's what we call immutable. If you change something, everybody's gonna be notified. So it's kind of just hack. You're gonna hack like thousand million of people at the same time because they're all there checking what's going on. It is peer to peer. The previous speakers mentioned this a lot. So no middleman anymore, that costs costs. We're gonna come back to that. And the most important, according to me, data freedom. You now own your own data. You can decide with whom you're gonna share your information. It's not the case anymore. If you look at the war between US and China, the Cold War is simply data war, right? They're, gonna, they're just fighting who's gonna dominate with the data because data is, in, is the, 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 the next gold, data is gold now, data is everywhere. And then some countries, some leader want to dominate it to be the, the powerful. And that's what's happening uh, against China and US, not only these two, but also in Europe, you know, with the manipulation of elections and all those companies manipulating each other, data. So data is the new gold, remember. Now, because data is the new gold, this is my definition of blockchain, if you ask me. It is complicated when you talk about blockchain, people always run away because at the end of, your, of the meeting of, of, or the end of the conference, they don't remember what the conference was about because it's too complicated. We call this the first mile problem. I'm gonna come back, back to that later. So blockchain, it, just remember, blockchain is open, accessible for all to join, where we all share or maintain the same book okay? and um, where transaction cannot be altered. You can't change anything with that. For the people being notified. Cut down the middleman, cut the intermediary. You own your data. Yeah? Just to put it like this. Now, I'm taking these two examples, these two companies. If you're familiar with Airbnb, Uber, and WhatsApp, they kind of, when it started, they disrupted, let's say the case of Airbnb, they disrupted the hotel industry, right? because it was cheaper now. You can now, you could now choose uh, to directly connect with the owner of the property, not even directly. I'll come back to that later. The same goes to, to Uber. 
So anyone could now start his taxi industry, just connect with Uber. But what is hidden behind is the cost that when you have your taxi service, you're paying roughly 60 to 70% to Uber. So this is huge. The same goes for if you have a room to rent to, 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 yeah, to rent to someone, and then you're paying us a lot of fee back to, to Airbnb. What, what if you were to use blockchain to cut down this intermediary, which is Uber and Airbnb, directly, one-to-one? -one? So that's what blockchain, that's where blockchain comes in, right? And then when we talk about being owner of your data, this is a big case, this WhatsApp. We know what's going on with uh, Facebook, with our information. We don't own our information. It's used to, for other ends, right? Good. Now, remember this. So blockchain makes us think big, think useful, think global, think inclusive. So if you have listened well to the previous speaker, I'm sure you have came across this. They talk about this, right? Because when you look at the banking system, I'm not going to make any enemies here. So I'm just an educator. An educator is someone that is here to educate people, tell what's going on. Um, let's go back to the 2008 financial crisis. You know, when this crisis hit, people were skeptic. You know, people didn't know what was going on. The big bank with the manipulation, big bank slash government, of course, all the time. Big banks and a government that work together, they manipulate um, the, the financial uh, system. They manip so they create inflation, inflation, whatever. Let's put the manipulate this, the money supply into the market. Therefore, we have inflation, inflation, all those terms, quantitative easing, all those, right? So they decide to pump the money into the economy. They use quantitative easing, to call that. So. Therefore, we customer we sometimes victim of that. So what's happened in, back in 2008? The, the, the housing price just collapsed because the bank were issuing those, those mortgage to anyone. I mean, people at a certain point couldn't pay back and that just generate and they explode, right? And then we had a financial crisis. So people were then skeptic. They didn't trust the banking system anymore. That's where exactly this blockchain, Bitcoin, just popping. I'm not, I don't like to talk too much about Bitcoin because when, when people hear about blockchain, they're suddenly linked to Bitcoin. Of course, they kind of connect it, but it's, there's much more to say on blockchain. It's not just Bitcoin, okay? So people became skeptic, so they were now searching for new banking system, new banking to, to, to get their money secure and safe. So they, they, therefore, the Bitcoin just pop up, and then we, here we are. And so it's going to save a lot uh, and mostly in the less developed countries because in a Western country, you know, not much is happening. I mean, you hear a lot about crypto, 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 but you don't hear a lot about blockchain. Yeah, because, you know, the Western countries feel like they're kind of, uh, they're, they're self-sufficient self already. They already, I mean, they don't really need it, right? But in, in the four countries, let's develop countries, there's a lot, a lot to, to happen, like Frank Oponi mentioned. I'm gonna point some of those points later. So one of the points men he mentioned, Frank Oponi mentioned was the uh, supply chain, agriculture. So I'm gonna use this example of cocoa. We all eat chocolate here in Europe. We take it for granted, it's, not, it's cheaper. But for some part of the world in Africa, there are people that never tested chocolates. I don't have time to show this video, but I have the link here. So after this presentation, I would like you to watch the video. So the video is about this farmer. Alphonse is a farmer in Avricos that uh, he's producing cocoa. Actually, cocoa are, is, are these beans to make chocolate. And then he has never tested chocolate at all, never. Can you imagine we're living in this world where people never, they're producing the raw material, making chocolate, and actually they never test chocolate. This is ridiculous. So, because the, the, the supply chain of this cocoa industry is so fragmented, there's so too many middlemen that I'm gonna show you here, as you can see. If you see what you see in this slide, the farmers, Alphonse is here, the farmers. You have collector, transporter, processor, exporter, global market, manufacturer, customer, customer. So, suppose a piece of, so Alphonse produces the cocoa beans, and then they transport to, to Switzerland, transform into chocolate and ship back to Africa, maybe Africa. 
Alphonse cannot even afford it because the bar of chocolate would come back to him and they would cost like roughly two euros when his daily income is not even two euros. Ridiculous. So if we were to use blockchain to just defragment the supply chain so that Alphonse here can connect directly with the end with, with the suppliers, that would be again a huge gain. Now, similarly, we always want quality food, sustainably grown, of course. Local source, fairly trade, affordable, definitely. But this is not always a guarantee. Yeah, because in the food industry, or the, just like the chocolate uh, uh, supply chain, the food industry is also very, very, the supply chain is also very fragmented because there's a lack of trust, transparency, and trustability. Um, you probably remember some scandal. A few years ago, we have this, uh, this egg scandal in Holland and some other countries in, uh, in Europe, I think Belgium and Germany, where the, 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 egg, the egg production was uh, completely polluted uh, by this uh, substance called the friponine. At that time, so they didn't know what was going on, they didn't know which, which uh, stock was polluted. So, and then they decided just to dis destroy thousand million of eggs, really. When you know that some part of the world people are begging for food and then we're destroying simply because we don't know what's going on, what is polluted, simply we just destroy it. Another example is the scandal in China when the, the baby milk was also uh, polluted. Uh, and then many babies just die. And if you still remember, that was a very shock moment because then in China, poor Chinese family couldn't afford because the, the, the baby milk price just exploded and therefore rich, rich people could afford it. But the production in Europe, in, in the, the in Dutch market, for example, for the case of Euro, uh, for the, the Netherlands, uh, we in Holland couldn't even uh, get uh, the baby milk because all the production was shipped to China and then we were going to the supermarket to fight with uh, Chinese because they were buying this baby milk and then to sell it in China 10 times the price, you know? So that was, this, that was the situation in Europe. And you see, if you were to use blockchain to assure the trustability and the transparency on the supply chain, we will avoid this scandal. These are only a few scandals. There are many, many scandals happening every week when it comes to foods and, uh, you know. And it's similar, we were eating horse uh, meat, to thinking we were eating beef, right? <laughs> and this big company, you know, actually, you don't know what they're doing. So they're selling this. Uh, we don't know what's high, it's, it's, it's hitting behind just because it's, it's not transparent. And then we've been talking a lot about transparency and then you see, when you mention blockchain, transparency and trust comes in. So if you were to use this uh, technology in these industries, life would be much easier. Yeah, some examples, many Dutch companies and many companies in the world, like Walmart in the US, they're using blockchain. Walmart now, in collaboration with IBM, they're using blockchain for the trustability of the products. Similarly, in, in the Dutch market, over time, is a supermarket they're using blockchain, the experimenting blockchain in the trustability of the oranges. So when a customer buys an orange or an orange juice with, a, with a, a QR code, he can scan or she can scan and then see exactly where the orange comes from, the stage in the supply chain that gives you more, uh, you more calm, trust when you buy a product, yeah? Now, can blockchain help increasing financial inclusion in Africa? You know, financial inclusion is, is simply uh, the fact that people are not, uh, in, uh, they don't take part in the financial uh, system. They don't have a bank account. They don't have an insurance. They're just not into the financial system. And that is a huge problem, not only in Africa, in many, many parts of the world, even in the U.S. When we look at U.S., we think it is, uh, ah, it is good. No, there's a part of the U.S. that people are very, very poor. Yeah, they don't even have a bank account. So also, they're also not into the financial inclusion. They're also in excluded in the financial system. 
right? Because they don't have an identification in the US, like I'm telling you, they cannot identify themselves. And the bank just don't trust them because you have to be in the, in the banking system, you should be trusted. The bank should trust you when, when you borrow money. You should be able to, to pay the back. But that, if you don't have an, an, an identification, you cannot even have a bank account. Yeah? And you can have a, 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 they have what they call the credit check to check if you can pay back, right? And so you can never borrow money to buy your house or get a mortgage if you're not fully. Yeah. I'm not going to talk too much about that. Let's talk about what, is, what matters more to Africa. And let's talk about remittances and blockchain. Um, for those who are familiar with remittances, so remittances is just the fact that we're sending money a lot abroad to our family and relatives. Me, for example, I'm sending money every month to my sister and brothers back home. And suppose I'm sending 100 euros. You know how much fee I will be paying? I will be paying 10 euros fee to send only 100 euros. This is ridiculous. Like Professor Errol said this morning, I wrote down, I was taking notes, and I wrote down a lot of things he said, but I would like to, to mention it because it's, it's, it's important. He said with blockchain, and then when we make a transaction, it is cross-border. It is in real time, cutting down transaction fee. Let's mention trans transaction fee here. I said that when you're sending 10 euros, at 100 euros, you're paying 10 euros fee, which is a lot, right? Now, if you were to use blockchain, the fee will be less than one euro, actually. Yes, so this is, this is the power of blockchain, right? And, and we know that remittance is a big deal for some people in the world, so for some part of the world. A country like Mali, Burkina Faso, they, they rely on, 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 on remittances. It's, it's a big deal in the, in, the, in the GDP, right? So without that, the country cannot run. So you see how important the remittances are. But you see that it's also a big deal for some company like Western Union, MoneyGram, with the huge fees, right? So blockchain is about to disrupt, it's, all, it's actually disrupting already this uh, big uh, industry, uh, remittance industry, by like cutting down the fee, cutting down this, the middleman. And these companies, Western Unions and MoneyGram are now experimenting what they call the digital wallet. And I can say that even late because Frank Ufuni mentioned that uh, talking about in Pesa, which is, which is just one of the example of the digital wallet. We have a lot of them in Africa. I'm going to show you some of them. So we have in Pesa that started many, many years ago. And we have then in the whole world now, we're now using digital wallets like Samsung Pay, Venmo, Apple, Apple Pay, and all those digital wallet. But the problem is they still link with a bank, right? So it's still kind of a central bank behind that, which is not what the crypto and the blockchain actually wants. They want to decentralize it, right? Let's don't go too complicated. Um, now look at this. The World Bank estimate that bringing down the remittance fee to 5% could put as much as, see that? 4 billion US dollar extra into the African hands, family, and local community. This is a big deal. So if you were to start a company, I would say step into blockchain and then into the remittance industry. Now, this is amazing. I went to Ghana recently with my mobile phone. I could pay these plantain chips to this lady just so to tell you how simple it is to use your mobile phone to, to, to buy something on the street. Ridiculous. It's not the case here in Europe, but recently not. Since the corona situation, now you can pay almost everything with your mobile phone. But before, it was not that easy. But 10 years ago in Africa, it was already possible. Because I'm telling you that the, these new technologies are now accessible to anyone to use. And Africa has just have to use it. So I can send easily money to, to my grandma. She doesn't even need to have a smartphone, just a normal phone. And then she can now make her transaction without having, even though she doesn't know how to read, she doesn't need an, an ID because the mobile phone will be her identification 
your, your, number, your mobile number will be your identification. Because the problem in Africa is that many people don't have a bank account because they don't have an identification. They, are, they cannot read, they don't understand the banking system. They don't have enough money to put in bank because bank want also to, to make profit. If you just come there to put five euros, they wouldn't like that. They want you to put a lot of money, to borrow a lot of money so that they can charge you just huge, those huge interest back, right? So, but with the mobile banking or digital wallet, it's not the case. So everybody can now access to the banking system. But yeah, with limitation, of course, because uh, if you want to buy a house, how much money can you get? You can get that huge amount of money on the digital wallet. It's not possible, right? So that is some of the limitations. But at least it's getting people into the banking system and then, then increasing the financial inclusion in Africa. Yeah, as I, as I said, you know, 70% of the population in sub saharan Africa is unbanked. They don't have a bank account, which is a big deal. Yeah, there are also some limitations of banking for the mobile banking. Uh, anytime you're making a money transfer, you also dealing with some hidden costs like SMS costs that people mostly don't know. And sometimes the internet connection is so weak that you cannot make a transaction. And most importantly is that uh, the cross-border transaction is sometimes is not possible. Yeah, that's the problem with mobile banking. The cross-border transaction is not possible, which is the, the big threat according to me. Can blockchain then and crypto take the mobile banking to the next level? Just to disrupt the mobile banking system, getting it cross border. Answer yet, yes, because Frank Oponi said that. Uh, this bit, uh, bit pay, he mentioned, bit pesa is doing that already. I have some other example. Yeah. So, uh, but before going to that, when it comes to Bitcoins, blockchain, crypto, we're dealing with the first mile and the last mile problem. I'm going to explain it. So the first mile problem is like, you know, blockchain, Bitcoin, crypto. It's difficult to explain to someone that, that has never heard about that. So this is the first mile problem. How do you demystify this concept? Look, we're all using internet. You don't need to explain to me how internet works. We all just use it because it is, it is a necessity. We need it, right? So if blockchain becomes like this, then we won't have that problem anymore. So there's still a long way to blockchain and crypto to become like internet. It is in the city, but it's still not, it's, in, it's still complicated to explain what it is. Therefore, we always use this example application to explain, right? Now, let's go back to the first mile. The first mile is, is still complicated. And the last mile is, suppose you donate a, a bunch of Bitcoins, of Ethereum, or any other, cryptocurrency to someone in Ghana or in Nigeria. Yeah, what next? What do you expect a person to do with those, with, with let's say 20 Bitcoin, which is a lot of money, which is a nice gesture for, from you, but the person actually cannot do anything with it because he cannot exchange to fiat money, he cannot go for shopping, and he cannot pay his bill. So this is the last mile problem because there's still a lot to do in Africa for the acceptance of Bitcoin, of crypto, yeah? But luckily, there are companies that are already speaking to solve that problem. Uh, Bit, uh, Bitpesa is the example that Professor Frank Upuri mentioned. Another example is Abra. This company functions as money exchanger from crypto to fiat money to local currency. Suppose then I'm aware to send uh, two Bitcoin to my colleagues in Accra Technical University through Abra, they will be receiving CDs directly, right? So I send the Bitcoin, they get CDs there. So this is happening already. And BitPesa is one of those companies together with Abra. But it's, it's, it's not that easy. There's a lot, a lot, there's still a lot of uh, regulation issues, barrier, and how much can you send, and still a long way to go, but it's getting, we're getting there. Now, we also mentioned today uh, a lot of other example application of blockchain. We mentioned education. Uh, if you look to the, the SDG goals, education is number four. 
yeah education is important so blockchain can help to personalize your education so that you study on your own tempo and education can become free or cheaper uh, one of the platform that we have created is coios that professor uh, um, uh, winful mentioned in the beginning coios is application is a platform that uh, is intended to provide a free education on blockchain simply uh, uh, yeah a place where you can choose where to study how to study and when to study simply put personalize your education and then professor error also mentioned that tokenization of education that's what course is doing so within the platform of course you can earn tokens as a reward for it's just like a game right so the next stage you get this 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 reward so forth and so forth and then when you grab, when you finish uh, let's say course you can exchange your tokens to any other commodity you want or you can donate your token to someone, maybe let's say in Cameroon, in, in Africa, that has not, that, that uh, doesn't have the same chance uh, like you to, to get education, right? So it's not only for students, also lecturers, educators can also onboard and share their content, exchange content. And so you see, it is free, totally free of charge. And then we, now experimented with uh, the Aqua Technical University. We have a joint courses that we're doing together. It's going very, very well. And I hope that uh, students from Aqua Technical University are online to watch this presentation. So we also talk about blockchain in line registration, which I'm not going to repeat. And then Professor Frank Pony mentioned BitLine, which is in Ghana, this company that is, uh, you know, land, land problem is, uh, Land registration is a problem in Africa, not only in Africa, in many parts of the world, where um, the same piece, piece of land can be sold to many, many people at the same time. Therefore, we have frustration, fraud, and manipulation, corruption. So then blockchain now can now disrupt and then solve this problem so that everything is registered. And uh, yeah, we have good quality of life, so no more frustration. Identification was mentioned, e-commerce was, was also mentioned. I'm not going to say all that. So thank you very much. Thank you, Irene, for uh, this presentation. Thank you so much. There are some uh, questions. I'm going to uh, refer to them in a minute. Mm -hmm. But uh, this has been very good. Now you can stop sharing your screen, don't yes, you? Yes, do that right now. Uh -huh. Yes. And... Um, let me mention this. This is going. This this is being recorded, and after editing this and cleaning up um, the interruptions and all that, we're going to make it available to you all. And all the participants, if they send their email addresses, we are going to send them a certificate for uh, participation. Let me mention this. Now, having said all of these, now questions are uh, coming in. Of course, uh, you have mentioned what kind of use blockchain technology could have, uh, but some questions are referring to not what kind of use blockchain technology could have, but how we can start using these technologies. What are the concrete steps or what kind of stages a country should go through in order to put this technology into use? Um, you know, one uh, question is asking, is the first step waste management, you know, could there be um, an application there, waste management? And if so, what could we do? Um, so what are the preconditions of uh, blockchain to work in terms of Internet of Things? Uh, is the availability of good IT infrastructure, G4 or G7, uh, G, G4 or G5, you know, their availability would that um, increase uh, the use of blockchain technology? And what are the challenges for developing these? These are uh, some kind of um, structural questions, you know, uh, relating to infrastructure, whether um, 
you know, we have certain steps to take in order to implement uh, the use of uh, these technologies, the infrastructure uh, question. Let's um, take these two questions in the first instance and then move on to others. Um, should, will you um, start saying a few things about this, starting from Irene? You know, okay, very good. You, you, you know, you've referred a lot to Africa because these questions are particularly relating to the continent. You know, what are the steps to be taken, whether infrastructure is important, G4, G5, um, with the you know, trade war between United States and China, and as yeah. you correctly mentioned, they, it's all about um, data and how we manage that data. Go ahead, Irene. Yeah, um, yeah, of course, uh, Africa is the is center today. I'm very proud of that, you know. It's not every, every day that Africa is in the, on top of the world. Okay, um, yeah, uh, as I said in the beginning of my presentation, uh, blockchain is, uh, is, uh, is playing as uh, bridging the gap between the Western and the poor country because it is an open, open source technology. Before, we never had such a technology that is free. And, you know, many other, other technology were uh, kind of uh, monopolized by those big companies, IBM, uh, Microsoft, you know, uh, before, you know, but blockchain, luckily, it is an open source, right? So and coming back to the question, what do we need to start a blockchain, let's say blockchain initiative? Uh, do we need a good, uh, let's say 4G uh, internet connection? Of, of course, of course, of course. And that is the problem, actually, that I mentioned, calling the, the, last, the last mile problem. Right. So if you were to use blockchain in a village somewhere in, in Ghana, where they don't even have electricity, it's useless. It doesn't make sense. Right. It doesn't make sense. So that is a, that's one of the challenge that we have in Africa. But luckily, luckily, we have good initiative from, uh, I think, Google and, and Facebook with the balloon providing free Internet everywhere. And yeah, to help the poor, because the poor is always affected. When it comes to financial inclusion, the poor. When it comes to education, the poor, because they just don't have the same uh, level of income to, to tap in, into, in, into the, let's say, the civilization world. But things are changing. Um, but you don't need that much if you want to start a business, a blockchain business. Like we mentioned land registration, which is a huge problem in Ghana. Just get everything registered on the platform where it is transparent and where the trust is assured. That will save a lot of problems in, in, in that country, for example, right? The government will be, it's gonna be a win for the government. It's gonna be a win for the local, a win for everybody. So a win, 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 win situation. Thank, thank you, Irene. Oponi, same thing um, to you. What are the steps to be taken in order to implement these technologies and what kind of challenges we have as far as infrastructure is concerned? And one additional question probably to you opening is how long it may take to bring about such infrastructure? Yeah, thank you very much. Um, as uh, Prof. Irene said, the blockchain platform um, is open and accessible to all, just like you have access to the internet. The most important thing is that the infrastructure must be there. Is that okay? So government together with NGOs and private companies need to have that infrastructure uh, in place. Um, so there has to be investments on the part of all key stakeholders. And it, it, there needs to be you know, education trying to convince all key stakeholders to invest in this particular um, uh, blockchain. So if you want to start any business um, or NGO, you can take advantage of a blockchain. For example, you have an IBM a Hyperledger, which is available. You can also use Ethereum or, or, or the Bitcoin blockchain. You understand? You can access and then put data in there. So it's about exposure to the platform, letting people understand um, the key applications and, and they will buy into the idea. But most of the time, it's the negativities that we ring along. And so it calls for education, but we understand it. In terms of the time span, I think we've come um, a long way anyway, because we talk about blockchain is still a new concept, 10 years, 15 years, still in the experimental stage. 
But I think that where we are now, it wouldn't take long for an, a serious eruption to take place. All we need is to position ourselves. For example, the coming up of the um, the G4 network, okay, yeah. and then now we are going to uh, 5G, okay, we have 4G, we're going to 5G, all these are going to open up um, the space. So though people may be in villages or remote areas, so far as government agenda is to extend, you know, power to these areas, I think um, ICT is catching up very fast. People have access to mobile phones. You don't need to have a big machine like a laptop in order to access blockchain. You can access it on your mobile phone. Is that okay? So wherever you are, you can begin implementing blockchain at a lower level and then grow on it gradually. Thank you very much, Bob. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Frank. The same question, those same questions goes to um, Erol Husser. But uh, I'm going to ask other questions, starting with you, Erol. Um, but let's see what, what is your take on these infrastructure and um, the step-by-step -step application of implementation. First of all, I would like to say I'm very optimistic in the development of the blockchain. Because the thing is, uh, when you look uh, to the story of the internet, internet was only a thing which would be used only internal uh, communication in the companies. And then suddenly with WWW, it went out of the world. The blockchain is the same and you know every innovation will come out with a need example uh, just uh, professor irene already mentioned uh, regarding this uh, payment things i mentioned too because there is now the the law of basel uh, tree and the banking system is completely changed you know for uh, for the disadvantage of the consumers, and they turn to use the blockchain system. As they mentioned, M-Pesa, Devere, Devol, there is a lot of uh, different kinds of payment systems. So what I'm saying is definitely everything, uh, because we are also talking internet of things, and you know, I think you need definitely some technological assumptions to be more in uh, blockchain development. But uh, I will say, uh, you know, as far as to my uh, experience, Africa countries, African countries, they are taking uh, this type of new innovation more faster than European countries. Because European countries are thinking, oh, we have some alternatives, but uh, Africa is growing now. And Africa is under the spotlight of many other, uh, I will say, uh, countries. Now, Africa is developing more faster in this type of innovation than the European ones. Because I'm founder of INATPA in the European Union. And the discussion was there that they would like to put an educational budget uh, on the digitalization of Europe over 4 billion euro. The reason is many of the European over 44 years of age could not use uh, this digitalization facts. But in Africa, it is more uh, developed to use this type of uh, royalty cards or cards, this type of things. And uh, uh, I, I think, you know, because our subject is more on the blockchain in Africa. I think uh, Africa has a lot of advantages also in the blockchain uh, systems. Because, uh, you know, uh, when you uh, start to talk about blockchain in uh, Europe, example, I would like to come the most common subject about the money transfers, as Professor Irini mentioned. You know, there is MoneyGram, there is Western Union, there is uh, a lot of things, but in reality, they are all useless because it is not real time. If I need money now, and if you send me money, 
it takes two days minimum that I got this money. But in blockchain, you got at the time that you put into the system, I can get the money anywhere in the world. If you put in Istanbul, I can get in Kenya in two seconds or one second, I don't know. I mean, this is very important development uh, in the uh, blockchain. And I was also looking, uh, just to add to your question, if I may, I was looking Q&A and I saw that uh, one of the participants with the name Jimmy is asking also about waste management. Yes, it is a very good idea to use a blockchain system in the uh, waste management because uh, there in waste management uh, things, there is a lot of, uh, I would say, steps, segregation, transportation, recycling, disposals, and uh, also analyzing all this uh, data, uh, waste uh, data, etc. But if you put everything on blockchain, it is very simple because we, uh, because we, we were also some of the speakers, valued speakers, they were saying to explain the blockchain. Blockchain is very simple. It is in blocks and everybody could participate. Everybody will, everything is transparent. And the most important thing is in this world, because the best thing in this world is to be free. So this is decentralized. You are free what you do. So it means also blockchain gives you the responsibility to act on behalf of yourself, not anymore for somebody else. You don't be like, if I may say the word, you are no more a milk cow for a bank or for a system. You do by yourself, you spare your uh, money, you save your money, and uh, you help your own people. Because what was mentioned is, yes, uh, you can, if you don't uh, use this uh, example, loyalty points, you can also give to, to someone else. So I think this is very important things. You know, blockchain, I think, is like a, still like a baby. And the most important thing is, that we should grow this baby in a good and safe manner. That's what I, should, I would like to say. Okay, thank you very much. Is there anything you would like to add on to these um, answers, Dr. Winful? Yeah, thank you. I would like to add a little to what this user just said, that the blockchain it's a good thing, and I see blockchain a big future for Africa because it looks like it addresses a lot of challenges that Africa is facing. And that explains why maybe Africa will have to embrace, and that explains why uh, Mr. User said Africa looks, it looks like Africa is going into the blockchain more than what Europe may do because it addresses a lot of challenges that we face. For example, when it comes to um, transparency, when it comes to cost, when it comes to the financial sector, as Rene mentioned, we have about 1.7 billion adults, about 1.7 billion adults without banks. And they are not able to do that, not because they don't want to be part of the financial sector, but because of some challenges. But with the blockchain and the mobile app, it will be very easy for most Africans to open an account. Um, I would also like to, one thing that I challenge, it challenges me is that blockchain, when we talk about blockchain, what comes to mind is that it looks like it's going to disrupt a lot of other sectors. What is there for them? We talk about blockchain may end up, we may not need maybe auditors coming in, intermediaries. What then becomes their future? These are some of the challenges. I remember um, I will have to enroll some students to join the chaos program. And I brought a lot of students from different faculties. And they were surprised. What, what are they coming to learn? 
they didn't see any link with their subject and blockchain. So I think in the area of education in Africa, we need to hammer it very, very well if blockchain is really going to liberate Africa. But I strongly believe that Africa is ready for blockchain and blockchain is also ready for Africa. The infrastructure is there, but we need to do more. And I believe platform like this is one of the best ways that we can use to address the challenges and to open the door for Africa. Thank you. Um, that's a very good intervention, Dr. Winful. And I fully agree with you that Africa is ready for blockchain because there are some uh, questions relating to whether Africa is ready to address uh, blockchain, you know, whether Africa is ready to uh, take this challenge. Um, but as you say, Africa is ready for blockchain. And many challenges in uh, Africa, particularly in Sub-Saharan Africa, can be dealt with um, using blockchain type of technologies much more efficiently. Therefore, you know, this should be put into service. Now, um, let's do another round of um, question and answer and then close the session. Uh, there is, of course, this is, um, you know, we have answered some of the questions about time, uh, time scale and other things. One very important question to me, it seems like uh, relating to employment, what kind of employment creation that blockchain can bring about or, you know, challenges with employment. That is uh, one question asked by um uh, one of the panelists, Ernest, Ernest asked this question. <clears throat> and um, the other question, which I think um, is important, you know, we have answered those, whether African people are, are ready to accept um, blockchain te technologies. But one other very important um, question is that <clears throat> uh, blockchain using such technologies this is uh, from Jimmy, may lead to divided societies in developing countries. You know, the ones who live in cities and do not have access to IT infrastructure, and those who live in countryside who do not have access. You know, those people who live in cities and have access to IT inf infrastructure and countryside. Uh, people who are not having access to such infrastructure. Could that create um, deeper divisions in the society? Whether um, Don Gio did answer this um, to a certain extent, but um, let's see how, how the panelists are uh, doing take on. But this time around, we start with Erol Lusen and then come back to Don Gio and wrap it up like that. At all way. Yeah. First of all, I would like to just add something. Uh, yes, blockchain could cause some unemployments, but blockchain will create new positions of employment. So, I mean, uh, that's first of all, uh, you know, uh, we should really make a type of uh, assumption advantages and disadvantages of blockchain. I mean, if you would like to live in a secure, unfraud, uh, happy world, then we must go for blockchain. Because even uh, in many countries, there is a lot of dispute on voting systems. Example, what happened in Belarus, you know, we know that the second candidate at the end must leave the country. So, First of all, blockchain uh, will change not only the uh, uh, job descriptions, it will change also the people, it will change the world. Because we are talking uh, from a system which is completely decentralized. So, uh, you know, I, I can say when we are talking to COVID, I would like to jump on another thing. With the uh, COVID-19, we learn a new lifestyle. You know, we are staying at homes, we are not going out, 
We are no more socializing. We are no more handshaking. We are no more kissing. You know, we are no more touching. You know, we are not using uh, many people the same bus. So it changes. Okay. It causes some problems, but it gives also some advantages. You know, today I think it is very early to talk about these things for blockchain. First of all, blockchain is, as I told you, it's a little boy growing or little girl growing now. It didn't come to a level that we can discuss uh, the use or the need or advantages, disadvantages really uh, on a sustain, uh, sustainable side of uh, the uh, blockchain. Example, I can say uh, we are talking now for our world circular economy. So when we are talking circular economy, you need blockchain. You can't, do, you can't talk from a circular economy without blockchain. And you know, I, I can say also uh, another uh, things on the uh, like waste management. I mean, you are talking, okay, we are talking that the uh, municipalities or the companies are collecting the uh, waste and they are saying we collected 10, 10 tons. We don't know it, they are telling us. But in blockchain, we will be sure how the life is uh, running. It, uh, I mean, I see a blockchain, it's a blockchain is a technology. You know, when you sometimes, I mean, when you are a natural lover, when you hear something, a new technological terms, uh, you get upset. But blockchain is also good for the nature. I mean, there is a lot of uh, things happening in the world, also in Africa. Africa is losing many uh, and the big, uh, flowers or trees, etc. when the people uh, tries to make more money, when they are greedy. And then if you are put everything on blockchain, you will see where it is, what happened. And then uh, uh, you can have uh, more because it is uh, more citizens' rights. You know, I mean, you will, you will stop the people, example, dumping, I would say, garbages, from the big countries to Africa or to some developing countries. Now you will know what's coming. You don't know. Also Turkey, they are dumping uh, a lot of garbages from uh, China or from US and you don't know whether aspects in it or whether it is uh, any problems for the people. You don't know. You are taking it, you are paying. But then if it is on blockchain, everything is uh, will be controlled. I mean, even uh, for uh, COVID system, uh, you know, COVID-19, there is blockchain applications that you can follow the people. You can not go closer when there is a danger there. You know, uh, we should look uh, blockchain uh, from the uh, side of, I would say, uh, of uh, more, uh, from the good uh, side, you know, I mean, he, 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 we should not say uh, for a little boy he is good or bad. Blockchain is a little boy. Let's grow. Let's uh, do. Because, you know, if we start to talk of something, I'm just saying like blockchain, if you say this is wrong, that should be that, that, then it means blockchain is like a tree and we are cutting all the uh, leaves, etc. Then what will happen? It will be a bonsai. But if we let blockchain grow, it will be a big uh, tree, and even we go and rest under the tree in the shadow of the tree. So let's support, uh, I will say, blockchain. It's very good also, this is very good panel. There are friends from Africa, there are friends from Holland, that we have, uh, like you, distinguished professors from Turkey. So it is good. We should come a consensus all the time. This is the main issue of blockchain. Blockchain is a matter of consensus. Everybody should agree when you build one blockchain. And when you agree, then it means everybody is in the favor of it. We should work for it. We should uh, give power to it. We should discuss the 
nobody knows a blockchain. Nobody could say at the moment, I'm an expert of blockchain. Nobody could say that. We learn from each other. We, we know what is the need of Africa and we see that something is used in Africa. We could implement this one in Turkey in a different manner, but it is the same subject. It is not, I mean, I don't want to really hear, oh, we don't have this technical, uh, how do you call it, a technical uh, base or this, we say, no. We could create everything by cooperating each other, working each other. And uh, I believe, uh, I believe personally, blockchain is the future because we are talking even, uh, I think Professor Irini mentioned about this token thing. Now we know that COVID, they, they don't want to use uh, paper bills. So what is the uh, opposite of paper bills? Then we should use some digital currency. Now I know many, in many countries, including many African countries, they are working, the central banks are working for digital currency. So this is uh, good to work, you know, we, then there will be no more theft. If I have my digital wallet in my pocket, and if I can go to somewhere, to a machine, or, and I can exchange it to fiat, then if I lose my wallet, I know only the key code, nobody could use it. So, I mean, we should think also from a very good side. You know, we should be optimistic uh, for blockchain. I'm not saying it is perfect, but it is in our hands to move, to do blockchain in a perfect uh, thing for the humanity, for the people. Yes, thank you. Um, that covers almost everything. Um, we all agree that uh, we are in the beginning, um, at the early stages of this development. And we also all agree upon uh, the fact that, you know, the kind of technology provided uh, through blockchain helps um, resolving many problems that we face, not only in Africa, but around the globe. Um, maybe uh, one of our participants, Jimmy, asking, you know, uh, and he wants to be a concrete answer to step-by-step uh, -step thing, maybe as, as a starter, um, in, strengthening infrastructure is an um, important first step to uh, go ahead with this. And by doing this, by doing this, as you have mentioned, uh, Mr. Hussain, by doing this, um, it enables us to prevent wasting natural resources plus Nation, nation's resources and putting available resources to the service of the nation um, and becoming more efficient in doing that, these, these technologies. So, um, starting with infrastructure is the first concrete step is the most important. Now, before I move on to um, Dr. Winful, I see, um, I see uh, Ajibola, he wants to say something. I'm going to allow him to talk. If you make it very brief, um, uh, Mr. Jibola, go ahead. Your microphone is unmuted. Can you hear us? K.S. Ajibola. Um, Nope, he's not there. So I'm going to mute him. Now, would you like to add things on to what um, Mr. Erosar was saying, like with regards to employment and um, using resources? Dr. Winful, Christian. Yeah, thank you very much. Um, I think with employment, there is that fear because I had experience with interaction with people who hear blockchain for the first time and you try to explain to them. And most of the times the question they ask is that this movement is going to push some of us out of business. And I think it is true just like was presented. 
But I liken it all the time with when computer was being introduced as a way of doing things. Computer was also going to push a lot of people. But it also created new jobs, as was presented by one presenter. But I think in subsequent presentation on blockchain, I believe if we link blockchain and how it creates jobs, will make a lot of people buy into the dream. Because there's a lot of challenge as to whether blockchain, immediately mention blockchain, people start to talk about whether it's a scam or whether I'm going to be out of business. I remember one of our visit to, when Hague University came to Ghana, we invited one of the financial institutions, I don't want to mention it, and they did not come because they think it's an illegal thing or the structure is not well. But the boss himself understood what the whole thing, but it was finding it difficult to come. These are some of the challenges that as we present blockchain as a new movement for our time, we should also come out clearly because there are a lot of people who are out there who are afraid that the blockchain is going to do us more harm than good. But I believe strongly the blockchain, whether you like it or not, in the next five years, if you don't have the knowledge in blockchain, you'll be out. Um, when he came and we we're having a program about blockchain in Ghana, surprisingly, students on campus didn't know much about it. But the advert people in the industry were calling to find out how they can participate because they've realized either some small symptoms of blockchain in their workplace. So I think when we talk about blockchain in line with the need for us to also learn because a new way of doing things will be in line with blockchain. So whether you are going to develop the program or you are not going to develop the block, your work or your normal activity at the workplace will involve blockchain one way or the other. So we all need to participate and learn something about blockchain. Just like we are all now using computer, a time will come we will all be using blockchain in our day-to-day -day activities. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for this prompt reply. Um, Donjia, will you also uh, say a few things about employment? But um, can you stress on um, the increase, you know, the using blockchain technologies will lead to increased efficiency in using resources in Africa? So this is like, and therefore it's a must, and what shall we do to promote it step by step? If you could just lay this out and it will be very helpful. Thank you very much. Uh, very good question, very hot question indeed. And yeah, I will not just say blockchain, I would say digital transformation since we talk about blockchain and new technology in Africa. Um, look, when we talk about digital transformation, we always also always look at the loss of job, unemployment that's gonna, it's gonna go up, like many people will be losing the job. Um, yeah, um, like Professor Errol said to start with, he said that losing job, many other jobs will be created. When, when the machine or the robotization of the, the industry is taking over, there are many, many other jobs that are created at the same time. Like, for example, maintaining those machines, maintaining the blockchain platform or maintaining any other plat digital platform, we need people to, take, to, to do that. So robots are taking over, let's say machine is taking over meticulous job that human cannot do or human cannot do. So, but you need human to still monitor and control that the whole system. You may say that, yeah, how many people will be doing that? Maybe a few people will be doing that. So still unemployment will still be going up. But yeah, many countries in the world are experimenting what they call universal basic income. Like if the robot or the machine is taking over our job, uh, at the same time, we can tax those robots. They will pay tax and then the money that we get can be equally redistributed to the population so that we or you and I just relax, quality of life or do some other thing that we 
never thought we could do. Therefore, you have quality of life, right? But let's don't go into that. It's just to, to, to mention that it's going on, right? It is being experimented, right? But we're not, we're not gonna, we should not fear that the technology is taking over. It's just what it is. There's nothing, we cannot stop it. When you go back to Africa, if you have to compare Africa to Europe, the gap is still very huge. Everything is uh, revolutionized here the, in basically the, the agriculture, the education, everything is revolutionized. Africa is still behind. So having this technology to come and revolutionize all those sectors, I don't see that it's going to be uh, a huge, um, let's say, concern for unemployment. Instead, I see a lot of opportunities, a lot of new jobs created. Yes. Thanks a lot, uh, Irene. Thank you. Um, Frank, last word is yours. What is your take on employment and improved, improved um, efficiency in using local resources? Uh, thank you very, very much. Um, see, that's, um, I think blockchain is going to open up a lot of um, employment. Now, blockchain is about opening up power to individuals. It's about ownership. It's going to lead to transparency and openness. So I think it's going to open up for competition. Is that okay? Whereby people begin to you know, exercise their talents freely. For example, let's come to research. There's a whole lot of legiary and you know rights issues, but then if I come out with a finding with blockchain, it is tamper proof, and therefore people are going to find it difficult, you know, plagiarizing my content, and that means rewards to me, because wherever the paper goes, I'm going to get back dividends. Is that okay? When it comes to the informal sector, for example, agriculture, as I said, if there is a very fast way for people to be paid then of course, they'll be motivated to start you know, their own small, small businesses. And therefore, since there's a serious connection between consumers and producers, intermediaries always come in and then they hike prices. So when there's the elimination of these intermediaries, then it will allow for uh, free trade. Is that okay? And therefore, people are going to um, earn so much and they'll be able to start up their own businesses. In fact, in the arena of blockchain itself and related um, sciences or, or activities, artificial intelligence is in, we have deep learning. So people are going to get seriously employed in all of these areas. Like Professor Iro said, uh, it's up to you and I to learn, no matter which stage of life that we are in, we can learn these basic skills. Is that okay? And that can create employment for all of us. With blockchain, it doesn't matter which country you are. It eliminates geographical barriers. And therefore, I can be in Ghana, somebody can be in South Africa and then be working for a big company in the US. Basically, because they cannot access blockchain infrastructure and be able to perform basic skills on their computers and, and mobile phones. Remember, Africa is coming up with a whole lot of teaming youths who are interested in digitization. And therefore, they'll be able to get access to lots of jobs, offer some kind of um, services, internships. Um, counseling, and I think there's a lot of promise for blockchain in terms of employment for Africa, especially. Thank you very much. See that. Well, thank you. What you have mentioned is um, extremely important. Um, you know, when we talk about the experience of Africa, some of the disadvantages emerges from unequal level of development mm -hmm. that Africa has been delinked and remaining behind with uh, you know this and this is a legacy of colonialism you know the huge history of the continent and it seems like you know it has been always difficult to catch up and you know compete on a level uh, plane you know the, uh, the plane ground level playing field it has been constantly in to disadvantage of um, the continent of Africa. With, with blockchain, now as Opuni, uh, Frank Opuni mentions, uh, one opportunity is reason that Africans could come on an equal basis to compete freely by using their innovative skills. And there, 
in Africa, there's no shortage of skills, as Erolu Ser was saying. So that opens up huge um, door. Uh, you know, the technology provides uh, such, a, such an important basis for equal competition with others. That is, um, that is my take on from this. And in order to achieve that equal opportunity for competition, what is needed to mobilize resources into good use, that is to start with building up necessary infrastructure. That is, that is where government should mobilize their efforts in order to implement this. And then, you know, um, we'll have um, a lot of, you know, optimistic future as Erol User has been saying. But I'm going to thank you all for joining in with this wonderful uh, webinar. I really enjoyed this and I hope you all enjoy, enjoyed it too. And I hope we'll keep in touch uh, with Dr. Winfall and Frank Opuni and Irene Dongio, who is a very old friend of mine. We work together with him in, around many places. Uh, for that, Adam, thank you very much for your support, the URAS and Istanbul Aydin University. And congr congratulations for the Blockchain Center at the university, um, Mr. Usar, and thanking you for your participation from sunny Bodrum, not London, but um, enjoy it while you can. Um, I wish you all um, all the best and um, thanking you. This is going to be available online. And if you please send your uh, written uh, material, it doesn't really matter, just small notes. We could, on, uh, we could also publish those online as well. So uh, thank you, and um, I hope you'll have a wonderful weekend. And uh, wishing you all all the best. Please stay healthy and away from coronavirus. Have a good thank day. You. Thank, thank you. you. I bring this to a close. Uh, now, thank Adam, please. Uh -huh. right. Thank you, Professor Ayubad. Let me also thank you. You, you thank every, every and each of our speak listening speakers from Poland and uh, from Ghana. Also, uh, Mr. Usair from Bodrum, uh, Turkey. I would like to thank you all for joining us and uh, for your contributions. And hope to uh, see your contributions at our next events as well. We would like to uh, continue our collaboration in other webinars or events. So we hope to see you, uh, not only you, but also our participants. I mean, even we are over, you know, uh, out of time, they uh, they were quite patient and uh, and very excited to listen to you at the end of our workshop. And we we will be sharing the recording after an editing, and we will be also sharing with our speakers. So we hope you will share through our, your networks as well. And uh, and please follow us on social media. We will be sharing this recording as well as some photos. Uh, so you will be able to follow us uh, for other events as well. And thanks uh, to our members, URAS member universities. We will be sharing our full term online events soon. So uh, you will be able to join us at our next events during the full semester of this academic year. Uh, thank, I would like to also thank organization committee and Professor Ibar for organizing uh, this wonderful workshop. And uh, and good evening, good afternoon from Turkey to all all of our participants and speakers, and bye bye. Bye bye. Bye bye. bye, -bye.